did the play show off their talents to the best of their abilities. Peccadillo Theatre Company, under the delightful direction of Dan Wackerman, is doing George Kelly's The Show Off, which focuses on a Philadelphia family that is appalled at their younger daughter Amy's choice in suitors. It is a blowhard and pathological liar named Aubrey. Her older sister Clara married Frank, a well-off man that Aubrey keeps hitting up for money. Mom and Dad are worried if Amy marries Aubrey, they will be stuck with him living in their house. Younger brother Joe is too busy tinkering with putting a radio together to care. What will become of everyone? Is it better to marry for love or security? Lovely cast on handsome set with gorgeous clothes. Once again, Peccadilla Theatre Company has shown the light on a wonderful old show. I have Leslie DeLeo's review of I'm Mindful of My Anxiety, a one-woman show written and performed by Elizabeth Wine, directed by Ashley Wren Collins. And Miss Wine applied her curiosity and writing ability to a journalism career, while her anxiety about including all relevant information and the fear of missing something led her to miss deadlines and forgo a meaningful social life. Miss Wine is very good at playing multiple roles, exasperated British newspaper editor, Russian acting teacher, for example. And there's something endearing about her as an actress, her vulnerability in opening up her inner world. Leslie felt that she and the director, again, Ashley Wren Collins, have put thought and care into this production. She gave it a happy face, and there's more on Facebook. Musicals Tonight is back with The Apple Tree, which consists of three short stories turned into musicals by that famous fiddler pair, Bach and Harnick. The first one is Mark Twain's The Diary of Adam and Eve, where they start out in Eden and end up in Tonawanda, which is a suburb of Buffalo, so that always made me giggle. And one of the uh, people in the ensemble is Marco, and he's from SUNY Fredonia. The second one is Frank Stockton's The Lady or the Tiger. A man must choose between two doors. One has a tiger and death, and the other has a lady and love. The third is Passionella, which is a modern-day take on Cinderella, where Chimney Sweep desperately wants to be a movie star. I've always loved that one. They did it at Fredonia, speaking of Fredonia, <laughs> with Elizabeth Knessler. Hail, Kness hail. Yes, <laughs> with Elizabeth Knessler, she played the movie star, and then Michael Wright was the snake, and Jack Darling, that handsome devil, played Adam and all the rest. Oh, still love it. Anyway. Um, musicals Tonight not only has gathered the greatest cast, but under Philip George's direction, this is cleverly staged with scarves util utilized in all manners of props and the ensemble is put through their paces to further enhance the story. In this case, we have Savannah Frazier, Garen McRoberts, and Matthew LaBanca are the three principals in all the different stories they get to show their range for comedy and poignancy and a major happy face. If you get a chance to see, this is such a delightful, wonderful show. This is Bob Creso's review of Up the Rabbit Hole, written by Andy Halliday, directed by G.R. Johnson, and developed by the Windowpane Theatre Company. Jack Harris, played by Tyler Jones, a gay young man, has fallen down the rabbit hole with his self-destructive cocaine addiction and his careless, sometimes dangerous, sexual behavior. He has a relationship with Robert, an older man played by Paul Gregus, but he's vulnerable and is exploited for money and sex by a friend, Timothy, played by Quinn Coughlin. Uh, Timothy's climb out of the rabbit hole to find some kind of eternal peace in order to move on with his life is what this is basically the story about. The play's strength lies in the caliber of the performances which are convincing and well done. More problems lie with the number of scenes and the length of some of them. Uh, Bob gave it a mixed face and again there's more on Facebook. Three of my favorite companies in the world have banded together to put on K-pop. Ars Nova, in association with Mai Theater and Woodshed Collective, have this book by Jason Kim, music and lyrics by Helen Park and Max Vernon. Max Vernon did The View Upstairs, if you remember, 
and you have directed by Teddy Bergman, who usually directs all these wonderful woodshed collectives under the guidance of Tamara Woodard, who I just, I love all these people so much. Anyway, in K-pop, we get to wander around K-pop station trying to help Moon and Ruby figure out how to make their Korean acts palatable for an American audience. We are sometimes led around by Jerry, who is conducting the focus group. We witness the drama between members of Faith, that's spelled with a capital F and the letter A, arguing over the tone it should take. Then there is the reigning diva, Moi, that's M-W-E, who is concerned over a younger singer replacing her. And the taskmasters, especially the dance captain, who are rehearsing Special K, that's the girl group. This was a lot of fun, and an important message was made while we got to enjoy fabulous performances and the costumes, and you even get to participate. At one point, I had to show her how to do the red carpet, and I was like panicking because I don't know how to do the red carpet. But then I remembered Angelina Jolie, so I said, well, you stick your leg out, you show your shoulder, and you do that selfie mm -hmm thing. Oh my God, and you get to drink, you get to run around, you get to see wonderful things acts and things and people and oh my god anyway it's worth all the hype that it's getting and i hope somehow it gets to be extended or they get to do more with this classic stage company and bay street theater present shakespeare's as you like it with original music by Stephen schwartz and directed and designed by john doyle we're back in the forest of arden and Rosalind and her girlhood companion Celia go to the forest when Celia's father, Duke Frederick, exiles Rosalind. Orlando goes to the forest to escape the wrath of the Duke as well as his elder brother. Previously, Orlando has vanquished Rosalind's heart and in the forest, Rosalind, disguised as the boy Ganymede, teaches Orlando, who had been deprived of civilized education by his brother, how to woo her. And I think this is, uh, John Doe's production is minimal in scenery and casting, but maximal emotional impact and the illumination of the complexities of the text. In this way, to me, it's the opposite of the public works presentation earlier this month in Central Park, which had a huge cast, but reduced the play to a cheerful one-dimensional joke. Ready? Okay. The gloves are <laughs> off! I friggin' hate this! We so disagree on this. <laughs> I thought this was the most dispirited, despicable display of trashing Shakespeare so brutally that in turning in his grave, he probably ended up in China, which would make better sense of this bizarre version than John Doyle has concocted. He loved getting rid of the most essential part of a play. In Dead Poets Society, there was no desk for them to stand on for the pivotal monarch captain, my captain. Here, there are no trees. This takes place in a forest. Everyone ends up in the forest. Poems are pinned on the forest. What do we get instead? Tell them, Mark. Well, you have lamps that are shaped like acorns. But again, the suggestion of the forest is most important. And it's presented like a group of troopers performing for themselves. We, as long as we understand they're in the forest, we don't have to see the trees. We can use our imagination. Oh. And there's so much richness, like Ellen Burstyn delivering the All the Worlds of the Stage and the Seven Ages of Man speech in a way that almost made me tearful in the theater. And I loved that. I loved Hannah Cable as Rosalind, who was a voice that has all sorts of musical range to it, is able to be fully convincing as both the woman and the boy, which in most productions they get either one right or the other, but not both. I thought the music was fine. I, I just thoroughly enjoyed this and I felt it really got all the darkness of the play, the melancholy of Jack Wiss, the death of Anna, the winter and summer of the forest, the ability to be in nature, but also the fear that you could die there. This was really a great production as far as I'm concerned. 
Turning a green lit lamp to white to represent a poem doesn't illuminate the text at all. It just shines on the director's ego to show off his nonsense instead of the rich poetry and the point of the writer. Not only has Mr. Doyle managed to ruin this lighthearted romp in the forest with its serious undertones of what jealousy, power hungriness, and mortality can bring, but he also managed to take incredibly talented actors that I have seen in other productions and I know personally how phenomenal they can be and turn them into dreadful, incomprehensible actors. Hannah Cabell, we agree on that, was the only one who escaped to the forest, but, and not only did she escape to the forest, she also escaped his bad direction. She was the only one to come across as the character intended. Unlike the fast-paced inflection of Quincy Tyler Bernstein or the garbled enunciation, which became nonsensiation, of Kyle Scatcliffe. Ha I thought he was very clear. Not at all. And, I, no. and I've seen him in other things. I am not disparaging him because I know he's good. But in this one, I don't know. It was well, horrible. Again, um, I got everything he had to say, and I thought it was really fine. So, I, you know, again, I don't think you need to be covered by a forest to appreciate the poetry of sentence? Shakespeare. Yes, I'm not go ahead. done. You're spoiling the whole rhythm of what I'm trying to say. You're just like John Doyle ruining my text. <laughs> I will now go back to it because it has a nice rhythm to it. Mr. Doyle managed to ruin this lighthearted romp, which I told you about. Okay. Um, so let me go back. All right. So, which becomes non-citation of Kyle Scatcliffe. Hannah Cabell's tone was conversational and emotional and when confronted with love, friendship, and filial devotion. It breaks my heart that I can't say the same of everyone, as this cast is filled with the most respected and versatile actors that I look forward to whenever I see their names in the program. I further disagree with Mark Sabbath as, <laughs> as you like community production of the Delacorte was magical and enchanting and captured the spirit of the play like none I've seen before. Doyle tried to infuse magic by having Andre de Shield open a multicolored umbrella and having the lights change color to show magic was happening. Otherwise, we wouldn't have known. This was the least, uh, there was at least some magic to do with the original music by Stephen War Schwartz, which came across as jazzy roaring 20 and no nothing to do with the rest of the play's vision, as the women were wearing these gorgeous Anne Hold Ward's 50s petticoated dresses, Orlando had overalls, and Andre de Shield looked like a golfing butler. Well, again, it's stuff taken out of the trunk. These are troopers performing for themselves and enjoying their magic in creating theater with very little Self around them. Self-indulgent like the director. That's your interpretation. I don't think so. I think it caught much more. The In the park, it was one-dimensional. There was, was none one of the sadness no. of it at all. It, it was sad. Was, my God, it was sad. I was get crying. Get me a chance, it. Eva. Oh, my God, you had nothing for but the, a chance. Uh, for the theatrical thing about the Seven Ages of Man was completely caught. They just had all the world as a stage, meaning it's a place for untalented people en masse to perform. Oh, my God, no. That's I, not what this play's about. Oh, 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 I see. Oh, actors. I mean, actors are allowed to pretend like they're not actors and putting on a show for themselves. They but are act actors. But actual they're doing it as... But, but you're, you're praising that, and yet when you have actual people putting on a show for the whole community, you disagree with that because that's pretentious. You're being pretentious. No, I'm just saying it's not as good. It's it, one dimensional. No, it was There's not. There's nothing of the text there. It was so ah! hot. It was horrible. In fact, mm -hmm. I was caught between being horrified, stupefied, and comatized. And you can't see the play for no trees and John Doyle. And now I think you should be shown it, thrown into a forest of your own making. <laughs> I have never been so ha unhappy in my life. I friggin' hated this, and I can't stand it when John Doyle ruins plays. I'm sure it's going to be one of the best productions of the season. Go see it. Avoid it like the plague. Kristen Hardwick recently saw No Wake, playwright William Donnelly, director Veronica Brady, and it was at 59 East 59th Street, but produced by Route 66 Theatre Company and Bella Vita Entertainment. Uh, this is a three-character play. A woman, her first husband, and her perfect new partner are brought together due to the death of a shared loved one. Uh, comedy is 
delicately layered among the poignant story, which offers emotional relief to the viewer. When it is done well, it works, and in no way, in no wake, it works very well. Okay. Um, so this is something, there's a lot more on Facebook, but Kristen gave it a happy face. Pershing Square Signature Theater continues their association with Suzanne Laurie Parks this time around with her fucking A, I mean, with her Hester plays. Or what's, oh, this is red, in the blood. <laughs> the red letter plays. This one is in the blood. Um, Susan Laurie Parks continues her fascination with Nathaniel Hawthorne's Scarlet Letter with In the Blood. In this version, Hester has five kids with five different dads. She lives under a bridge with only a hustler, street doctor, welfare lady, and preacher to help her out, but all anyone does is take advantage of her. How far can a person sacrifice before snapping? Wonderful cast that were very agile in changing clothes, characters, and locale. Louisa Thompson's scenic design provided a great deal of fun for the cast and the audience watching them sliding down this chalkboardish incline. As a single mom myself, I could connect with Hester's plight. It's interesting that in fucking A, Hester had all the power, while the, in the play, Hester was powerless against her fate within the blood. And I like this one too. And if you get there early enough, you can see Susan Laurie Parks performing with the rock, her rock band. At the Cherry Lane Theater, I got to see The Gospel According to Thomas Jefferson, Charles Dickens, and Count Leo Tolstoy, Discord. It's written by Scott Carter, directed by Kimberly Sr. And it's really these three famous writers find themselves locked in a room together in the afterlife. They soon discover that the one item unifying their experience in life was an attempt to write the Gospel, the Christian Bible story of, of Jesus Christ. However, they're wildly different people. Jefferson is a man of the Enlightenment who believes that only natural science and what we could see with our perception should be in the Gospel and no angels, no virgin birth. Um, Tolstoy is a man who came from the aristocracy but so identified with peasants that he dresses as one but also questions some of the more miraculous things. Dickens, a man who came from poverty to extreme fame and richness, I guess had a lot more to be grateful for and thoroughly believed in everything and was very sentimental about keeping the angels, keeping the virgin birth and everything. So these guys have a lot to disagree about, but I think you'll agree that it's a very entertaining, enlightening story. I give it a happy face minus because I'm not so fond of afterlife plays. At the York is Desperate Measures. Peter Kellogg and David Friedman have done the impossible with Desperate Measures. They have solved the problem in Shakespeare's problem play, Measure for Measure, and turned it into a rollicking, five-splitting, and joyful musical. Condemned man's Johnny Blood's nun sister is the only hope to save him if she sleeps with Dashley Governor. Which is more important, her chastity or her brother's life? Will Johnny's dance hall girlfriend save the day? And uh, there'll be more of a review on our next show, October 14th. But I have a whole bunch of interviews and musical excerpts from this from before the show opened and after the show opened at the opening. So there's lots to show you. And I'll have the just snippets here, but the whole thing will end up on a YouTube at the Facebook page. But in the meantime, I just want you to know you've got to October 29th to see this wonderful musical with a marvelous cast. Now for some musical numbers from Desperate Measures and some interviews. Hopefully I'll get to everyone. If not, you can find the whole thing on the Facebook page. All the whole thing. Feels wonderful. I love playing the villains. Villains, are, villains drive the action, so it's, it's wonderful to be the uh, the bad guy. And this is a very, very fun bad guy, and uh, it's it's just a delight. It's just a it's a wonderful play. Very funny. Very very sweet and emotional, and then yet and yet very funny and, and, and heartfelt. And, and it's just a delight to be uh, on stage with these other five folks who are just terrific in the show. So. And this is the nun, sort of learning what it's like. 
when you have feelings you weren't planning. And uh, this is Emma Deverstedt singing, What Is This Feeling? I get to start as one thing, and then she really is the one who has to change the most throughout the play. And she, you see her kind of, you know, start to chip away at that coldness, and then she'll, you know, something will happen, and she'll change, and then she'll try to go back and revert to that person that she was in the beginning, and that's why it's so lovely at the end that she has to make that choice if she's going to continue with this changed person that she is, or if she's going to try to go back. time in jail yeah it's 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 good for me I can I can sit and recline for a while that's rather confining in a musical you can't kick up your heels very much well that's what you might think but you'd be surprised the magic of theater we can open cages and suddenly have dance moves and, yeah, and prison cells and musicals have plenty of space for dancing <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this was our chance to do a country score, and Measure for Measure made a, a wonderful Western because everything works well as an, as an analogy. So, uh, One of the things we really like to do is talk about very important issues in a humorous and light way so that I think that the information gets in because people are laughing and this is very light but it also is very much of the heart and it's very much about things that are very important today about uh, morality and about how people treat each other and about corruption and and it's all done in a very light and entertaining way so that it can really hit you when it needs to. When I, I'll admit that when I heard that we were doing it, uh, it was it took me a minute to understand, but reading it on the page, once we get up and, and we started working it, it's such a beautiful take. Um, the adaptation is, is, is loose to serve the musical, but but this piece is funny and so full of heart, and uh, and it's you know it has a, it has great value, um, and takes those major themes I think from measure for measure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Marichek. And uh, you, what do you do in? Oh, you're the priest, right? I'm the uh, priest who doesn't believe in God, who's a drunk. <laughs> and what's this about you reading Nietzsche? Uh, yes, I'm reading Friedrich Nietzsche, and he, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, to him, uh, is. The, the, the best philosopher in the world, and he says that uh, in this show. Um, and Friedrich Nietzsche doesn't believe in God, so that he, he the priest starts questioning God, um, and so he's, he's caught between believing God and not believing in God. So in order to compensate for that, he just stays drunk all the time, especially uh, during Mass. <laughs> interesting it's about justice and you know Shakespeare is no slouch he really had a few things to say about it and when you get to the essence of that part of it and then translate it to a sort of knee slap and musical some very interesting things happen I mean justice is an elusive thing and it's relative and and all the gray areas that sometimes try to get erased there are some and this play explores really what is fair and uh, and does it with beautiful songs and really funny script. It's Again, full reviews and musical numbers are on the Facebook page. And uh, they're doing my favorite play, Hand to God, in Teaneck, New Jersey, where they were just given an award by the Chamber of Commerce. So it must be a really good theater company. And I'm seeing Oh My Sweet Land, so that review will be showing up on the Facebook page. And I'm hoping to see my lingerie play, because that's with Diana O, oh, one of my favorite people in the world. 
We'll be talking about Mary Jane and Andrew Boris on our next show, which is basically an old 1710 play, which is still relevant. And next on musicals tonight are Bells Are Ringing. And there's a, a on gala with John Guare, Hershey Felder Sing Along, Nant, a bunch of musical plays to look at, and Amos is doing something. And you can tell we're filming ourselves again because I forgot to put it back after As You Like It because I was so upset. But one thing that me and Mark can agree on is Prince of Broadway. Both of us love this. It's closing October 29th, and we'll talk about it on our next show, October 28th. And at uh, 54 Below, Scott Siegel's got his 54 of Broadway's Greatest Hits. Charles Bush is going to be there. And my friend Andrew Porritz is going to be there October 24th. And at Panagia, you've got Lavender Songs and Carol Lipnick. And at the Triad, Anything Can Happen in the Theater, Songs and More, Yeston. And New Victory is back with The Young King by Oscar Wilde. Playwrights Rises now has a treasurer. We'll talk about that on our next show. Tartuffe is uh, the Phoenix th Theater, which we like. And 59 is 59th Street. The Mecca Tales at Sheen Center. And here I'll be talking about Whiskey Pants on our next show. And Theater for the Chroma Luminarianism. That's all about um, Surratt. And La Mama's back with the Belarus Free Theater. You know how good they are. And the brick is back too. And James Thierry's back at BAM with the Toad New. And Momentous Mori is this amazing puppet thing. And they got Richard III and Cherry Lane's got primary stages. And Mark saw Inanimate. I don't have time to give you the review, but he loved it. Inanimate Objects Come to Life. He said it was just terrific. So go to the Facebook page to hear his review of um, Inanimate. Uh, Michael Freeman Memorial is going to be at the public October 23rd at 7.30. Abrams um, Art Center has lots going on. And on our next show, I'm going to talk about The Honeymooners, which I saw at the paper mill that closes October 29th. Eye of the Storm is closing October 29th. Uh, King Company. Ace Ted Greenberg is a hoot and a holler. And these are the reviews that close that we have on the um, Facebook page. On the shore of the wide world, the Atlantic, and Inanimate, that's still going on. And these are the parody production shows that they recommend you go see. And we're going to see some of them, so... And don't forget to pick up your Performing Arts Insider, especially with the new season starting up. It's a cultural heartbeat, tells you everything's going on next to October 28th. And don't forget to go to our Facebook page, because that's where all the reviews are and interviews and all sorts of cool stuff.